Uh, Carving is going to be available to answer questions uh, during the break. Next speaker is going to be Dr. Jeremy Mathis. He's, the, he's at, uh, with the Arctic Research Office, Climate Program Office at NOAA, and he's going to talk, talk to us about NOAA Arctic Research ac Activities. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here, and it's good to follow a fellow Texan. It's always nice to have two of us in the same place, just for safety's sake. Uh, I want to thank Pablo and John uh, for the invitation uh, to come and speak and the great job that they've done with putting on the forum uh, in these past couple of days. And so as we're wrapping up two and a half days in, I do want to take a minute to just pause and think about the context of what's going on. Sometimes I think we lose some perspective of how big the changes that are occurring actually are. So this figure is showing the temperature anomaly for the average 2016 temperature compared to the historical average for the Arctic. And you can see in some places the temperature on average was 11 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. And that is astounding. There's no adjective, there's no um, there's no simile that would properly describe how big of a temperature increase that was for 2016. And if that happened over New York City or Los Angeles or Washington, D.C., the average temperature was 11 or 12 degrees warmer in one year compared to the historical average, it would be a headline on every newspaper in the country. So we have to remember what's happening and, and the ultimate drivers uh, of why we're here uh, at this conference and what we're going to be dealing with going forward in the Arctic. And we've seen slides similar to this uh, throughout the past two and a half days. But I really want to make the point that the Arctic amplification is really starting to, to kick in. The red line there is the global average temperature anomaly going back to 1900. So you can see we're at about a one degree Celsius temperature anomaly right now. But the blue line is the average Arctic temperature. And so you can see that the Arctic has warmed twice as fast, particularly over the last decade or so, as we continue to have a loss of sea ice and a loss of reflective snow uh, and a loss of the reflective glacier surfaces. The Arctic is darkening, and that darkening is driving this uh, separation of temperature between uh, the global average and the Arctic. So we think about these unprecedented changes that they're occurring. As I said, the average temperature in 2016 was far higher than anything we've observed in the temperature record. There were monthly temperature records set in January, February, October, November, and December of 2016. And that was a big change from what we had seen in the past. The Arctic had been a story of summertime excursions, summer sea ice minimum, summer temperature events. Uh, the changes were happening during the summer months. And in 2016, the warming and the record-breaking conditions propagated into the winter months, which was different uh, than what it had been in the past. We also saw uh, another minimum sea ice extent uh, in 2016. It tied 2007 for the second lowest. And as we saw in the previous talk, 2017 looks like we're setting up to be uh, very close to or perhaps breaking the all-time record low uh, that we set uh, on land. The Greenland ice sheet in 2016 had the second lowest onset uh, of melt, of when the melting of the glacier started to occur. And finally, uh, and I think this is going to add some relevance, and that's why it was great to follow Carvin, is that we're starting to understand the global connections that change in the Arctic is starting to have uh, to weather systems and climate systems out in the lower 48 and throughout North America. So with that, NOAA uh, has a very strong mission in the Arctic. Uh, we're doing a lot of things in the Arctic, and what you've seen uh, from Carvin's talk and what you heard from Craig McLean uh, on our first morning here on Tuesday. But NOAA's Arctic mission is to determine how the Arctic system is changing on time scales of weeks to decades, particularly with respect to the consequences that the loss of sea ice may have on Arctic ecosystems, coastal management, economic development, and northern hemisphere severe weather events. And we've identified two priorities uh, that we're looking at. The first one is to develop sustained Arctic observing and data management capabilities to improve coupled ocean sea ice atmosphere monitoring and modeling efforts in order to advance our understanding of climate impacts on ecosystems and biological resources. And our second priority is more on the operational side which is to enhance the scientific framework and capabilities forming the foundation 
for navigation services and spill response to support increased ship traffic and commercial development across the Arctic Basin. So in the Arctic Research Program, what do, which does sit uh, in the Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research, OAR, and then under the Climate Program Office, we have five lines of effort that we're pursuing right now that are supporting those two NOAA priorities that I just showed you. The first one uh, is focused on the Distributed Biological Observatory. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the DBO. It's been around for several years now. But uh, it's a program to occupy those red boxes that you see uh, on the map. And it's not just a U.S. effort. It's an international effort with Korea uh, and Canada and Japan. So the countries, as they go into and out of the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea each year, they stop and they occupy uh, the red lines in those boxes, which are biological hotspots, places where we're seeing broad ecosystem changes. And so by each country stopping and doing those occupations, we're developing a really nice change detection array, particularly as the time series builds over time. And it's giving us some tremendous insights into how the ecosystem is responding to the physical drivers that are undergoing such a rapid transition. In a few weeks, uh, we'll be going up uh, on a NOAA-led DBO cruise. We're calling it the Northern Chukchi Integrated Study, NCIS to identify the physical and chemical drivers that create the biological hotspots at the head of Barrow Canyon and at other parts of the northern Chukchi Sea. We're very excited to be partnering with the Coast Guard to do a 22-day cruise that will include everything from ocean acidification to marine mammal research uh, and quite a bit of outreach that we'll be doing while we're on board the ship. Our second line of effort uh, that we're also very excited about is our annual surveys of the Arctic using unmanned drones and gliders. And for the first year ever, we're going to take the sail drones into the Arctic. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the sail drone is a new platform. It's about the size of a Hobie Cat sailboat. Uh, it's got a tremendous payload, duration, capacity. Uh, it can measure physical, biological, and chemical parameters, including uh, gases in the atmosphere and in the ocean. So this uh, can do ocean acidification measurements, which for those of you who know me, is something that's very important to me. Um, so the sail drone... Um, just launched, oops, sorry, the sail drones are going to launch uh, from Dutch Harbor. Uh, they're going to sail up through the Bering Strait. One of the sail drones is going to stop and is going to occupy the DBO line in this box, DBO line four. So the sail drone is going to come up and just go back and forth across the line uh, for several weeks. Then we'll come up on the Healy and we'll do an occupation of the line on the Healy while the sail drone is there and then the ship will come out and the sail drone will remain on station, continuing to occupy the line. So we'll get a really nice time series uh, throughout a couple of months of what's going on at that spot. The second sail drone is just going to go as far north as it possibly can. And looking at the ice conditions right now, we think we're going to be able to push well into the Arctic Basin uh, before the sail drone has to turn around and come back home again so we can get it out uh, before it starts getting dark. Uh, but we are excited about this. The sail drones launched uh, about 40 hours ago. Uh, so this was their positions as about four hours ago. Uh, sail drone uh, number one uh, is making its trip up because we want to get it to the DBO line as quickly as possible. Sail drone two and then a third sail drone uh, are coming over here and are going to calibrate with a mooring that we have uh, here in the Bering Sea. And then they'll also head up towards the Arctic. Our third line of effort uh, is the International Arctic System for Observing uh, the Atmosphere, uh, another very successful program that maintains a series uh, of atmospheric observatories around the Arctic, particularly at Barrow and at Tixi, Russia. This has been a great collaboration that we've been able to maintain with Russia over a number of years, uh, and we've got uh, a great deal of data uh, and understanding of the Arctic out uh, of this observing program that's looking at everything from greenhouse gases uh, to light uh, to different drivers uh, changing the atmospheric boundary conditions uh, across the Arctic. Our fourth line of effort is to support expanded modeling of climate, sea ice, and ecosystem responses to changing environmental conditions. And this is to inform better observing systems in the Arctic, where we need to put our observing assets. And so this slide, again, is looking at sea ice, uh, particularly the sea ice anomaly that we observed in 2016 in the Arctic. So the negative lines here show you the millions of square kilometers under the normal sea ice conditions that we would expect. Uh, and so you can see where I've circled here. These are the months of the year, January through November. 
and the number ones that I've circled are the months when the all-time record low sea ice was observed. So you can see for most of the months in 2016, the Arctic was well below normal conditions. Another thing we're looking at uh, is how the temperature increases will continue in the Arctic. The three slides you see here, uh, the one on the left, uh, is the global average temperature. Uh, and you can see that even under a, a best case scenario, if we hold global average temperature to a two degree increase, the temperature increase in the Arctic is going to be on the order of five degrees Celsius and even bigger in the wintertime, about a seven degree average uh, temperature increase in the Arctic. So regardless of any mitigating efforts we put into place now, the Arctic is going to change. The Arctic is going to be a fundamentally different environment over the next few decades than it has been. So we have to start thinking about and preparing for that. Uh, and a, a byproduct of that is understanding how that change is going to impact weather systems uh, down uh, in the lower 48 and across the northern hemisphere. Just simply put, uh, the jet stream, uh, which is the, the air current that gives us most of our weather pattern uh, down here in the lower 48, exists because of the temperature gradient between the cold air mass in the Arctic and the warmer air mass over the lower latitudes. And so as the Arctic warms at twice the global average, that temperature differential between the two air masses starts to break down, and it can cause the jet stream to start to meander and do some unusual things bringing things like high pressure and drought uh, to the western parts of the United States and shifting cold air down uh, onto the East Coast. So that's what we've experienced the past few years uh, here in Washington, D.C., where we've had some unusual cold winters. Our fifth line of effort, something we're also very excited about, is standing up a U.S. Arctic Observing Network, a U.S. Aon office. Sandy Starkweather is taking the lead on this and is serving as the executive director uh, of the U.S. Aon effort. And it's just to support uh, the existing data systems that we have uh, and turning those data systems into products. Uh, and so we want to establish a task-driven uh, U.S. Aon to mobilize U.S. contributions towards integrated and well-defined observing networks that enable access to high-quality data expertise and information in support of scientific understanding, local needs, and agency operations. And they're taking on a number of tasks. The first one is to improve observing capacity for sea ice forecasting and navigational products. They're also going to be looking at improving cyber infrastructure for synthesizing and applying ship tracking data, uh, AIS, uh, towards regional decision making, improve uh, observational products for terrestrial snow cover, and finally improve biogeochemistry products for fisheries management. So if Sandy hasn't already been in touch with you, I imagine you will hear from her uh, in the very near future. And one of the first tasks they're taking on is going to be this operational multi-sensor ice thickness product uh, that's been the holy grail uh, of a, a need for an operational sea ice product for forecast uh, models. Um, we really need that. Uh, the challenge has been there's currently no single observing technology that provides comprehensive real-time sea ice thickness. And so Sandy and the group uh, are going to take a, a, a task approach where they're going to assemble uh, an interdisciplinary team comprised of experts from technology, model developers, uh, and operational ice centers to develop a fit-for-purpose multi-sensor product. So this is something we'll be looking forward to seeing. One of our other efforts that we're standing up uh, that we're really excited about uh, is the new IARPIC collaboration team on environmental intelligence. You heard about IARPIC from Martin Jeffries uh, yesterday. The environmental intelligence team is new. Uh, it has the mandate to integrate environmental knowledge in a timely, reliable, and suitable way for decision support. And it's going to combine observing, modeling, and data integration. And the question is, why do we need environmental intelligence? And, and I think that's clear at this point. But just to reinforce, we're seeing that 2016 was an unprecedented year, and those trends have continued into 2017 with a clear, stronger, and more pronounced signal of persistent warming at any point in their observational record. And so with that, we need to expand and improve sustained information gathering in the Arctic to provide this actionable intelligence and forecasting needed by the residents and the stakeholders because as we've seen for the last two and a half days, we're now thinking about food security, cultural survival, uh, and community health, as well as taking advantage of opportunities uh, as commerce increases, as trade increases, uh, and national security becomes an even larger issue in the Arctic than it already has. So with environmental intelligence, 
we're going to be framing the EI discussion and our, our environmental intelligence activities around societal benefit areas. So we were happy to work with STIPI, the Science and Technology Policy Institute, uh, back in January uh, to develop some societal benefit areas that will allow uh, not only the Arctic observing effort to focus on, but also environmental intelligence to focus on. So things like disaster preparedness and food security, human health, uh, resilient communities and weather and climate are just a few of the societal benefit areas that we'll be taking on. And we've developed this environmental intelligence cycle uh, that we're going to use to think about uh, going through these societal benefit areas, how we're going to respond. So starting with decision support, providing options for action, and then going in and looking at the data that we currently have, translating the objective data sets that we already have and our data repository into fundamental evidence and understanding so that we, we can then strategically fill the gaps in the observing that we currently have. Rather than thinking about we have to go observe everything everywhere, we need strategic and targeted observing focused on the gaps that we identify once we've looked through our data repositories. Once we identify and fill our data gaps, we move into validating models and improving models with the obser observations that we're making. And then moving into the next step, uh, which is assessing how responsive those three first steps have been uh, to meeting the stakeholder needs, and then that takes us back uh, right to the top of our cycle again, so that we're, we're constantly checking ourselves on how responsive and how successful we are uh, at meeting the needs of the residents and the stakeholders. And so the faster we can get through this cycle, the more responsive we can be to the needs of the community. So one of the first things we're going to take on with environmental intelligence is an integrated assessment of the carbon system in the Arctic. What we've done here is we've mapped out all of the research objectives from all of the IARPIC collaboration teams onto this diagram. Uh, and so you can see atmosphere, uh, sea ice team, uh, the, uh, all the different components of the IARPIC plan. We've pulled this together and now we hope to be able to coordinate and drive a community-wide effort to refine and improve the carbon budget and our understanding of the carbon system uh, in the Arctic. And so we know uh, that we can use the environmental intelligence framework and U.S. Aon capabilities that we're standing up to enhance food security, support tourism, and facilitate increased ship traffic in the Arctic, and also develop, de you know, foster development across the entire Arctic. So for those of you who are interested in environmental intelligence or Arctic in general, I would really encourage you Please go to the website and sign up for account. an account. It's, it's free, it's easy, and it'll let you tie in uh, to a lot of activities that are going on uh, in this community space right now. And for more information about what, what NOAA is doing in the Arctic, what the Arctic Research Program is doing in the Arctic, please visit uh, our website, which has some great summaries uh, of a lot of the stuff that I've talked about today. So thank you again, Pablo and John, and uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you, Jeremy. Before we go to the break, I, I have a question that came online that I'd like to post to you. Under the U.S. Arctic Observing Network, how will traditional knowledge be included? That's a great question. We see traditional knowledge as being a cornerstone uh, of U.S. Aon and, and the data we're pulling in. So my triangle that I had for our nested observing framework had our community-based observers right at the top of the pyramid. We see them as being uh, users of the data, but also providers of the data. So Sandy uh, and the group are, are working closely, particularly with uh, the efforts that are going on at the EPA right now, uh, to make sure that we incorporate uh, and have the community observations uh, as a focal point in the effort. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, I think we could all go to the break. I'll see you at quarter past 10. Thank you, Jeremy, once again.